Marvel, that was a dirty trick. I think until now, you could have made a good case for the Spider-Man movies being the most light-hearted films in the MCU. Homecoming, Far From Home, they were basically action comedies with a little bit of drama sprinkled in. Enough that you could take it seriously, but not so much that they didn't feel safe. Not so much that you had to brace yourself before seeing them. And now, after seeing No Way Home yesterday, I'm wondering if that was all by design. If those first two movies were made that way on purpose to lure the audience into a false sense of security so we'd go into this one not expecting what was coming so it would hit that much harder. Hats off to him, that worked like a charm. If you haven't seen it yet, get ready, because you are not prepared. Not only is this far and away the most heavy and dramatic of the Spider-Man MCU movies, I swear, there are emotional gut punches in this film, and yeah, I said gut punches plural, that rival any of the ones in Avengers Endgame. For my money, they might even hit harder, because at least when the big moments came in Endgame, they were happening to emotionally mature adults who had been through a lot and were equipped to handle them, as painful as they were. Here, these things are happening to a kid, and I think that's the most important thing to remember here. That throughout this trilogy, Peter Parker has been a kid. He's been doing his best and sort of playing at being a superhero, but he hasn't really been put through the shit, so he hasn't really become Spider-Man yet. And it wasn't until I saw No Way Home that I realized this whole trilogy has been an origin story. Because this movie is when that happens. This movie is when we find Peter on the worst day of his life, when he gets tested like he never has before, and when he finally learns what it really means to be Spider-Man. And by that, I mean the guy who has the best intentions, though he can't seem to stop screwing things up, but he comes through in the end and saves the day, usually at the cost of screwing himself over even more. That's who Spider-Man is. And by the end of this movie, he's become that guy. He's finally learned that painful lesson about power and responsibility. You, like me, may have wondered why he never got that lesson in any of the other movies. Well, in this one, you find out why they've been keeping that in their pocket for so long. And I won't spoil it, but I think the writers found the best way to impart this. In Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, the lesson felt preachy and telegraphed, like they hadn't really earned it yet. In Amazing Spider-Man, they tried to say it without saying it, which I preferred. It felt more natural that way. But the way they do it here is the most powerful, by far, because it comes from the right person at the right time and it's then enforced by people who really understand what it means because they know. They've been through the shit that Peter's going through right now. So, essentially, they spent an entire trilogy of movies telling the story of Amazing Fantasy number 15. It was a long road to get there, but I'll be damned if this didn't get me. I cried two separate times during this. Not just misty-eyed, real tears. Once because it was so sad, and once because it was so uplifting. They really take you on an emotional emotional roller coaster here, but by the time you get to the end, you know you're not watching a kid playing at being a hero anymore. This is Spider-Man. In more ways than one. In fact, I think this movie might be the answer to the critics out there who haven't been wild about this version of the character. How he gets too many lucky breaks, or he was Tony Stark's pet project, how he had too much help with the high-tech Stark suit, and always being able to count on reinforcements from an Avenger, or Nick Fury, or Happy Hogan, or whatever. Well, it looks like that won't be a thing anymore, because Peter is up shit creek by the end of this movie, and they set the table so that going forward, he's really going to be the hard luck hero that Spider-Man is supposed to be. Partly because of the old Parker luck, and partly because he keeps shooting himself in the foot in his efforts to do the right thing. They make great use of that aspect of Spider-Man. The character is very well serviced here, and he's not the only one. You've seen the villains in the trailers, you know who's showing up, and I had concerns about this because some of those villains, or most of them actually, are from movies I'm not a big fan of. Not that the casting was bad, I just didn't like how they were written or what was done with them. Well, holy moly does this film work overtime on the character surgery because not only were they presented better, but they were written better. Example, Norman Osborn. Willem Dafoe is great cast 
casting. He always was. But the first Raimi movie was so silly and campy and, let's be honest, made for kids. And Defoe was obviously directed to play the character in sort of an over-the-top cartoonish way, so he never really felt genuinely sinister or frightening like the Green Goblin should be. Not the case here. And they didn't even have to change that much, really. It's just a more subtle performance where the cartoony aspects are dialed back to a reasonable level, and with the kid gloves off now, he has the freedom to do some really evil shit. And I could not believe what a difference this made. Same thing with Electro. They make a few little tweaks, the goofy crap is gone, he's more serious, they got rid of the terrible comb over, and just like that, Electro suddenly feels like a real person. He's actually cool now. They all are. And they don't just come off better in that sense. The movie actually takes the time to give the characters some closure, too. There are a few mental gymnastics required to accept why some of these villains are suddenly not dead anymore, and the explanation isn't 100% bulletproof. There's one or two holes in it. Like, there's a character who appears in one of the stingers, and with the explanation they gave, that person being there does not make sense at all. But once the movie's got these guys, all their character arcs pick up right where they left off, maybe going in a different direction this time. Because these are not cameo appearances. The villains play significant roles, and their characters are all wrapped up. Like, they might get an ending that is different from what the other movies did, but it still feels right. And that's about all I can say without getting into spoilers, but I can't not talk about the rest of this stuff, so... Welcome back to the spoiler section. If you want a spoiler warning, there you go. Okay, there's two big cameos in this movie. The first one is... Great! Peter's in legal trouble because of the Mysterio fiasco, so he lawyers up, and who does he get? Matt f***ing Murdoch! Charlie Cox showed up on the screen, and everyone in my theater cheered. He gets Peter out of legal trouble, he gets to show off his powers, it's only one scene, but it's awesome. Daredevil is back, Kingpin's back as of last Wednesday, I can't believe they had all that coordinated. Feige's working on so many different levels, it's nuts. And the second cameo is pretty stupid. In fact, it's the stupidest thing in the movie. Not shockingly, it's Venom. Tom Hardy from the Sony Venom movies shows up in the stinger, and I'm guessing he was only there because of studio politics, because they don't even bother explaining why he's even there in the first place. The story is that because Doctor Strange's spell went wrong, anyone in the multiverse who knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man is being brought into this universe, but Eddie Brock didn't know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So why is he there? It, it, it makes no sense. And then, when he gets sucked back into his own universe, a little piece of the symbiote gets left behind. And that's also stupid, because why would that happen? This isn't like you close a door and your shirt gets caught in it or something. It's a magic spell. Everyone who got misplaced is going back to their own universe. Why would a piece of one of them be exempt from that? I mean, I guess they want to do the black costume saga now, but that's such a dumb way to set it up. And does this mean that we're gonna have to deal with the Sony version of the Venom symbiote when that happens? No thank you. Luckily, all the other characters are used much better. Like the other Spider-Men. So yeah, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire show up. Duh. And it's pretty great. Now, if you know me, or if you've been watching me for any length of time, you know I'm not big on Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker. I didn't like a lot of the choices they made with his version. It wasn't for me, I just wasn't a fan of it. Until today. They finally got me to like the Tobey Maguire incarnation. And why? Because, guess what? He shows up and he's not crying, he's not dancing, he's not whining in every single scene about how much he loves Mary Jane. He's just... Peter Parker. Like with Norman Osborn, a few little tweaks was all it took. Damn it, if we'd had this version of those characters before, I might have had a very different opinion of the Raimi movies. Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker, I liked him in The Amazing Spider-Man, and I liked him here too. They're both used great because the script is smart enough to play up the parts of these characters that worked and downplay or make jokes about the parts that didn't. Like they see Toby using his organic web shooters, and the other two are like, oh my 
God, your webbing comes out of you? That's so weird! I have to make my web fluid in a lab and I run out all the time. It is such a hassle. There's a bunch of funny bits like that and they all work. But the best part is how their stories and their character development is also continued, just like with the villains. We find out where they are in their lives since their movies ended. They reflect on their successes and failures and how that made them who they are, how each of them learned the power and responsibility lesson. And this relates to what our Peter is going through right now, and they can give him advice and help out in some pretty poignant ways. Like Andrew talks about how after Gwen died, he was really angry and lost, and later he gets... Not a do-over exactly, but he gets a second chance to save the girl that Peter Parker loves. And that was one of the times I cried because it's a really emotional, cathartic moment and you can just see the relief wash over him. He finally got that monkey off his back. It was great. And they do it with Toby too, because when Peter is fighting Norman Osborn, things are getting really dark and Peter's about to go to a place he can't come back from, but Toby stops him. Which makes sense because Toby knows where Peter is is right now. He's been there himself and he knows this won't fix anything. This won't make Peter feel better. It's very effective, subtle, moving character stuff and it just works. How about that? After all these years I can finally get on board with Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Better late than never, right? I was really impressed. Toby and Andrew are given a lot of respect here. They even did callbacks to the musical cues from those movies. I think fans of both are gonna be thrilled with this. And when all three Spider-Men are teaming up to fight the villains together, you guys, it's so f***ing cool. With the writing and directing choices, I don't think it reaches the same heights as the big team up in Avengers Endgame. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd probably give it like a high 7 or an 8, but that's still pretty awesome awesome. And it's hard to imagine how they could have gotten better use out of Toby and Andrew here. I just wish we could have gotten more time with them. And they were used so well, and the character surgery was so effective that, believe it or not, I was actually hoping we might see Kirsten Dunst show up so they could work that same magic with Mary Jane. And by the rules of the spell, Emma Stone's Gwen Stacy could have shown up too. Unfortunately, we don't see them. And I get it, there's a ton of characters in this thing but I was hoping we might see stingers with Toby and Andrew back in their own universes and maybe the girls could pop up for a minute. Missed opportunity there. I have to say though, I've never been big on the multiverse concept because it's so often exploited and used as a deus ex machina by lazy writers or transparently turned into a vehicle to generate concepts for toys and that stuff really bugs me. But this movie is a rare example of the multiverse being used well because here it was just done to tell a good story. It was about character, it was about emotional pathos, it never became cheap or exploitative, they didn't go overboard with it, the characters from other universes had a purpose and development you could care about, everyone meant something, and hot damn, if you have to use the multiverse, that's how it's done. And yeah, Venom technically existed too, but you know what? He makes a quick cameo, I'm guessing just to fulfill some agreement with Sony, he does nothing, and then he goes right back to where he came from. So I didn't like him being there, but at least it was pretty painless. No Way Home turned out to be a very accurate title because after this one, there's no going back for Peter. Everything's gonna be different now, and it'll be tough, but if this film was any indication, it's gonna be a hell of a ride. This movie was great! We never got an official Sinister Six, which was weird, but the movie was so satisfying I didn't even care. I don't know if it'll be my favorite of the Spider-Man Home Trilogy to watch just because it is very emotionally exhausting, but it's definitely the best film of the three. Tom Holland gives his best performance as Spider-Man yet. He is really damn good in this movie. I'm so happy we're getting another trilogy with him. I do have one big gripe about the movie though. Why do they keep putting the Spider-Man theme song in the trailers, but it's never in the movies? Da -na -na, da -na -na. They just refuse to use it, doing that still good but not nearly as catchy theme song instead. I don't understand. They obviously know we want the theme song, but they just won't use it. It almost feels like they're trolling us. And if they pull that crap with the X-Men theme song too, when the X-Men finally join the MCU, I will complain on the internet. 
So don't even think about it, Marvel. Thanks for watching, everybody. Let me know what you thought about Spider-Man No Way Home in the comments. Ding the bell icon and follow my social media so you'll always be notified when I upload new stuff. Links to all that and to my live streaming channel are down below. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up, share, subscribe, and make sure you're still subscribed because what really deserves to have all its mortal enemies from across the multiverse be sucked into this reality and try to kill him is the YouTube algorithm. That's all for now, but I'll be back with more soon. So stay tuned for that, do all the YouTube things, and I'll see you next time.